what I do want to talk to you about is this thing that we've been working on called the Parallel Pandemic Project. Um, and to begin with, I want to thank my colleagues here at George Mason and the University of Karachi in Pakistan, uh, as well as the U uh, U.S. Consulate in Karachi for their financial support for this project and the organizers of today's event. Um, the Parallel Pandemic Project, which we call PPP, um, goes back till t actually well before the pandemic to 2013, when I began working uh, with a group of scholars in Karachi uh, through a program organized by the State Department uh, to tie U.S. Pakistani universities together. Uh, before that, I had rarely been, I'd been to Pakistan twice. Uh, now I've been there 12 or 13 times. Uh, it is a wonderful place. If you can ever go, go. Uh, anyway, so what we worked on was a way to do uh, curriculum development and capacity building among social scientists in Karachi um, and brought uh, a dozen uh, faculty and graduate students uh, from Karachi to Fairfax. And I and my colleagues went to Karachi a number of times as part of this project. And it culminated in a survey of about 2,000 uh, households in the city of Karachi. Um, many of you may not know, Karachi is what's known as a mega city, uh, population roughly 23 million. Um, you know, one of the largest cities in the world and trying to figure out how to provide the data that's necessary to make informed decisions was part of what we were working on. And so we continued to collaborate after these, uh, the formal partnership ended um, and had visits back and forth. And then as the pandemic began, uh, one of my colleagues and I began talking amongst ourselves using Zoom um, and realized you know, that this, was, you know, I, this is a once in a lifetime event and hopefully once in a lifetime, and trying to think about uh, what can we learn from this and how can we, as we look at our two different societies, the United States and Pakistan, so very different, what can we learn from this? And so we began to have even more conversations where we would invite students from uh, Mason and from the University of Karachi. And uh, as we had these conversations, the consulate uh, in Karachi heard about them and said, why don't, you, why don't you come up with a formal proposal to us so that we can help support this endeavor? And that's what led to the PPP. Um, it really had three aims. Uh, and it's still ongoing. Uh, the first was to use a comparative social science research framework to learn from COVID-19. Uh, what we did is we really view the, uh, we view COVID-19 as extreme, an extreme exogenous shock uh, to very different societies. And again, we were focusing at this point on the US and Pakistan. And you know, personally, as a sociologist, I believe that we have to take social structure seriously. It changes people's lives. But if we're going to treat social structure as a variable, then we need non-trivial variation. And this is why I really believe in my work and a number of sociologists feel the same way, that we have to do comparative and or historical work. And that's where we get the variation in social structure. And so we wanted to look at this and see COVID-19 as a stress test for a variety of institutions and uh, cultural norms and learn from how you know, this one sort of common exogenous shock played itself out in these different societies. So that was our main objective. But then, you know, and this is something that um, I think it goes back actually to Thomas Jefferson, who talked about it, is that uh, science is a really uh, sort of concrete, powerful form of people to people diplomacy. You know, you get to know one another and you get to understand one another. So that was another piece of what we were doing. And then the third uh, aim we had is if you think back to last summer, seems forever ago. Um, we didn't know what was going on. We still don't know completely, but we know a lot more. And so this really became, you know, we started this uh, series of weekly conversations that became a communal space for faculty and graduate students to talk about their lived experience. And that really became um, the structure we used in the first phase of the PPP. 
And there what we did in July and August is we organized eight thematic sessions uh, and they went through different, um, different dimensions of society. We talked about healthcare, the economy, legislative responses, policy implementation, religion, the family, education, and media and communications. And what we wanted to do in each of these sessions that went on about two hours is we had an expert um, from each country, from Pakistan and the United States, give a 20 minute presentation about, um, you know, so for example, about religion in Pakistan, a predominantly Muslim country. Um, and then we had um, Professor John Turner, uh, from the College of Humanities and Social Sciences gave a 20 minute introduction to religious life in the United States. And in each of these presentations at the very end, they talked a little bit about uh, the impact of the pandemic and also the impact of that aspect of society on the way we live through the pandemic. And then we broke out uh, into breakout rooms you know, at the, uh, I'm trying to think when, this is my third semester teaching online. Um, and last spring, I had no idea what a breakout room was, um, but we became very adept at assigning people to breakout rooms. And what we did is we mixed up Pakistanis and Americans. Um, and they were primarily Americans who have never and may never go to Pakistan and Pakistanis who um, have never been to the United States and may never come here. And they spent, you know, about 20 minutes talking with one another, getting to know one another and sort of share, um, you know, sh sharing the lived experience of the pandemic. And then we came back together and um, kind of summarized what people learned. And I really don't have time to go through all eight topics. Um, you know, uh, for example, the, uh, and we do have a website uh, called parallelpandemicproject.com uh, where we actually have videotapes of each of the expert sessions and the follow-up discussion. Uh, and some of them are remarkable. Um, you know, the quality of the lectures that people gave were phenomenal. Um, you know, for example, with healthcare, uh, we had Dr. Dennis McBride, who is a well-known neuroscientist and former Mason uh, faculty affiliate, uh, who talked about the difference between, in the United States, that we, you know, as, as Dennis said, we don't really have a healthcare system we have a public health system, and then which is focused on prevention, and then we have a private system, or primarily private system, that tries to fix people. That's more clinical medicine. And when these two come together, uh, and Dennis uses the term a wicked problem, it becomes a wicked problem if you try to fix or change one part, and it has important implications for the system as a whole. And then you know his uh, comparable speaker. Um, was Dr. Um, Abdulbari Khan, uh, who's a prominent physician in, in Pakistan and a member of the Pakistani COVID-19 National Task Force. And, you know, what he talked about, and it really became an important theme for us, and the healthcare uh, discussion was the first of our thematic discussions. You know, what he brought up was, if you think about Pakistan, you know, 21% of the population live below the international poverty line. It's a poor country. Um, and many of them have lack of access to clean water. You know, we talk about washing our hands, um, you know, that the water you're washing your hands in may not be clean there. Um, you know, that almost all of healthcare comes out of pocket. And there are 9.6 doctors for every 10,000 individuals in Pakistan. That's compared to the United States where we have 25.9 doctors per 10,000. And then when you look at the statistics and you know, when we met in July in Pakistan, there had been, in Pakistan, if you don't know, the population is 220 million. So two thirds the size of the United States. And at that point there were 5,709 deaths. In the United States, at that point, we had 134,312 deaths. And this ratio has continued. The disparity in case rates and death rates um, between the two countries, where it's much lower in Pakistan, some of that may be attributed to reporting, 
but a difference of that magnitude is not just reporting. And so that's part of what we tried to figure out and what we're still trying to figure out is how do we explain the difference? You know, to a certain extent, you know, as um, Dr. Kosha uh, brought up, you know, there are these incredibly detailed, important health and biological issues involved. But then those are intertwined with social organization, with culture and politics. Um, and so at this point, we're trying to disentangle this. You know, and if you look at, for example, the youth population, you know, Pakistan's a very young society. Um, the median age is about 23 compared to 43 in the United States. Um, but the fact that you have such a young society is not unrelated to Islamic religious beliefs. And so trying to figure this out, or if also the fact that in both countries, um, public health measures are embedded in a political system. And so really that's what we're trying now as we move from this first phase you know, where we learned about different things and found some similarities and differences, you know, that there are differences in that, you know, Pakistan, as I said, is a very poor, very young society, um, at least compared to the United States. You know, as we, and again, it's hard to remember, but a year ago, going in, or a little more than a year ago, going into the pandemic, the U.S. economy was on, well, it was on fire. You know, we had very low unemployment, the economy was growing rapidly. In Pakistan, it was the opposite. You know, the economy was really in trouble. Um, and then there are certain similarities between the two countries. You know, that the, um, both countries are federal states, you know, where there is a central government, a state government, and there are local governments. You know, in the United States, this is an old tradition you know, it's been around um, for 100, 200 and some odd years. Pakistan was formed. And again, you know, a lot of people don't know the history of South Asia. Uh, Pakistan was created in 1947 and has had a very volatile lifetime as a nation. Um, and so thinking through, you know, there have been three coups in Pakistan since its creation. You know, and, you know, that seemed uh, very distinctive. But then if you think about January 6th in the United States, where we had an insurrection, you know, that the political circumstances all, all come into play. And so as we think about sort of what are some of our takeaways, uh, and as we're entering now, what we did over the summer, we called phase one. And now we're beginning with phase two of the project, where we've split ourselves up into um, five or six different uh, teams, um, U.S. and Pakistani, and a combination of graduate students uh, that the, um, the U.S. State Department has provided stipends for. Um, they're not great, but they're, you know, there's a financial incentive for our graduate students and the Pakistani students to work with us as we develop formal, formal research proposals, ways to go to places like the World Bank, the United Nations, the Gates Foundation, to try to say, you know, this is not the last global crisis we're going to face. You know, COVID-19 really should be a wake-up call and that we have to figure out how our global society um, addresses global problems and comes up with global solutions and do so in a way that recognizes that not every society is the same. You know, that the decision-making capability, the culture that's supporting the, um, the decisions made by policymakers is very different. And how do we coordinate that and think about ways to get um, sort of global, co global cooperation and collaboration among states with very different uh, forms of government and very different education systems, very different um, economic systems. And so really what we're trying to do is think about how we can move forward, you know, as a couple of the speakers previously have said, what lessons have we learned? And what we're focusing on is what's the impact of social structure, the, the parts of culture and uh, the way our societies are, that are, the way they're organized that either mitigate or exacerbate 
something like COVID-19. And to think about, you know, as we move forward, um, what's going to change? What's this new normal that we're talking about? What is it going to look like? And Provost Ginsburg was one of our speakers on the uh, when we talked about education. And one of the things he brought up is a, a very simple, broad model is that when you have some disruption, there's adaptation and then there is acceleration. And the important thing to realize, though, is <clears throat> and this is what I think we learn from looking at different cultures, is that this does not uh, happen with a blank slate. That the process of disruption and then adaptation is based on the organization of a society when it happens. And that's then going to influence the acceleration and adaptation that follows. You know, so for example, you know, we didn't, <clears throat> we had remote learning before COVID-19. We had telework, we had telemedicine. And now these have moved into a whole nother, you know, a whole different scale. And that's true in the United States, but perhaps not in other cultures. And so it's really a matter of sort of global problem solving in part through global learning from one another. Um, and if any of the students here, faculty are interested in joining this effort, you know, we're in, uh, as we look at um, this phase two, we're also considering not just the US and Pakistan. You know, again, I said the variation in social structure is critical to our analysis. So the more variation we get, the better. And, you know, we are a very open group. Uh, you're welcome to contact me at jwitte at gmu.edu uh, and join our conversation. So wishing you the, the best for the rest of the afternoon.